is might find this a little repetitive. Uh, my impression from previous years is that doesn't hurt you. Uh, it actually helps solidify a few things. Uh, if you are really, really bored, because as you've seen all of this before, um, then uh, stick around. You'll, you'll, you'll get to apply that uh, later in the term. But today, I'm not going to make any, any further excuses about it. Uh, simple example. I said, OK, what color are stop signs? Most people would say, well, that's pretty simple. They're red. And if you look at all these images of stop signs, well, you're not, you're not wrong. But there's more to the color of a stop sign than just a single answer. Um, so it, it may not even be a single RGB combination. Uh, here, you can obviously see that there's uh, quite a lot of other sort of text and things on a stop sign, either in black or white. And then the illumination of the scene will determine whether the red is actually looking more red or more pink uh, or some other color. It might be that really with stop signs, asking the color is the wrong way to identify them. Maybe we should be looking at shape. Um, so we will eventually get around to describing the shapes of objects. But for today, I just want to start off with this example because it's not it's not our job to try to boil down the description of something, uh, whether it's the feature like the color or the state of the world uh, to just one number. Uh, it, it is actually kind of a mistake to jump in and say, all right, I'm just going to take this very rich thing and I'm just going to save one number. And instead, we, we want to keep track of uh, a variety of numbers. We want to keep track of the variable itself, the color, and maybe allow for more variation than just a single right answer. So throughout the entire term, we're going to be using x's and y's, and not just as coordinates on a 2D grid, but we're going to use them as random variables. So uh, it's not called random because it's just completely random, and we don't care, and we, we sort of have given up on, on uh, getting a real number. Uh, it's because we are accepting that there's going to be some uncertainty. And our, our goal throughout the class is trying to shrink that uncertainty and, and model it correctly. Modeling it correctly just means that if someone ever asks you for an answer, you can say, well, um, I can give you the top answer, but I can also give you the distribution. And so we'll, we'll talk about what that means. So a random variable, it could be the result of um, experiment or some kind of world measurement. So if you uh, flip a coin, you might say, OK, that's heads uh, versus tails. So we might have a random variable x that says, what is the result of flipping the coin? And just instead of calling it heads and tails, we'll call it 0 and 1. So now we have a random variable that is modeling what happens when we flip a coin. And it's not uh, we're not ignoring the fact that a single instance of a coin flip gives us a single answer. right? Either gives us a zero or it gives us a one. But we're allowing for the fact that we might have multiple coin flips that we have to worry about. If we observe more instances of x, we get different values. We are going to keep track of that. And we're going to look at the relationships between the coin flips x and maybe other variables, like who is flipping the coin, or where was the coin manufactured? Got a few more people. Don't be shy. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, if you can't see because you're behind the pillar, feel free to kind of try to squeeze over here. There are at least two seats left right here, uh, not in direct firing line, but very close. Uh, so if you if you want to have a seat so you can see the slides, go ahead. Now now is your chance. Yes, the guys back there, you can see. No, you can't see. The so so there's there's one seat and the second seat. Come come on up or 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 stay behind the pillar. It's up to you. But those those two seats are are available. To you. No, <laughs> oh, shyness wins. That's terrible. All right, I, I can't I can't help uh, I can't help cure shyness. All right, so we're going to try to keep track of our random variable. And we're going to try to model what happens with our coin flips 
or with our other variables by keeping track of maybe history, maybe our training data, and we're going to, to say, well, we're going to keep track of the probability distribution of the random variable. So, uh, someone hands you some dice. Maybe it's not uh, Monopoly because the stakes are too low. Maybe this is Vegas, and you really want to know, are these dice fair? Right? So, you, you throw the dice uh, once, and uh, the number seven comes up. You should be very worried. Okay, so the number three comes up and you say, okay, great, that was one instance of three. So you increment the little counter here on the three and you throw the dice some more and you keep incrementing the counters and you see maybe this is not the most fair uh, die we've encountered. So now what we have here is that we have our random variable is represented as, as x, just a little x. Our random variable happens to be on the x-axis, that's coincidence. And our y-axis is measuring the probability. We're, we're going to make the assumption, this is a bit of a leap, but, but it's a very convenient assumption that what we've seen so far is representative of the future. That the next time I throw the die, or a single, single dice, um, I'm going to expect that a one will happen with probability of 0.17, Right, so the two will happen with some probability of, and I'm just reading off this value, 0 0.22, right? And a five will happen with the greatest probability, it'll be 0.3 something. So, this is my single random variable, single dimensional random value variable, and this is the probability of each of the possible outcomes. We can represent this in a bunch of different ways, and we're going to continue representing it throughout the term in, in basically two or three standard ways. So um, this is a, a kind of visual representation where the size of the squares is supposed to be proportional to the number it represents. So if we're describing the weather, right, we made uh, some kind of vision system that's looking up at the sky, it's got this nice fisheye lens, and it's trying to keep track of the environment uh, at noon every day. And uh, it computes a bunch of features, and in the end it says, right, um, this is the proportion of days when it was rainy, this is the proportion of days it was drizzly, cloudy, snowy, sleepy, and so on. So here we have very discrete instances of what the weather can be like, uh, just like we have discrete faces of, of a cube. What do you think comes next after this slide? What other kind of random variables can we have? Continuous. Continuous, someone says. Yes. So, Maybe weather shouldn't be so quantized, actually, uh, that it's just these, uh, whatever it is, six, six, seven flavors of, of weather. Maybe it should be more continuous. Maybe we could just talk about temperature, right? So we can have a continuous random variable that says, uh, okay, this is, this x-axis represents the different locations on the real number line. Um, that represent our that our random variables representing, and the same way probability density is representing the chances of any one of those situations happening. There's one more chair up here. That's fine. All right, uh, and this happens to be between zero and two, but there's no reason that a random variable has to have these bounds or just some other bounds. When you pick a new random variable, you get full control over that, you can say its upper limit is such and such, its lower limit is such and such, and you can decide if it's continuous or discrete. Those decisions will, will have impact later, uh, but our goal right now is just to introduce the idea that when you see an x or you see a y, etc., in, in our equations, that's, that's supposed to conjure up images like this. All right. So, We've got to start off with probability. We're going to say there are two random variables, x and y, and uh, maybe we're going to observe them simultaneously. So we're going to say, I'm going to uh, set up a camera in the classroom at the door, and as people walk in, I'm going to uh, estimate their height. And maybe uh, we're also going to put a sensor in the floor. We're going to estimate their weight. Now, typically, height and weight will be correlated or uncorrelated? <coughs> correlated, we would hope. Um, so maybe there's a dependency between x and y. Maybe it's sufficient to just measure one or the other. But for now, we're, we're not making any judgments. We're just 
observing. So we're just going to collect the data. Um, if we collect the data for one classroom and for another, for, we collect the data at an airport and get lots and lots of people, we can imagine making the kind of, the kind of random variable graph that we saw here, except it's 2D instead of 1D. This is, this is a 1D random variable, and we're just happening to, to plot on the y-axis the probability of um, how long it takes someone to complete the exam. But if we are looking at the probability of a given, when I say height, and a given weight, then we are collecting our information. We're probably going to plot it in a nice sort of 2D representation. So you can imagine this is our, our 2D representation. We're going to say uh, height, we can say weight, and the the more people we have for a given combination of this height and this weight, the higher this this plot will be. Is that is that okay? We're okay with that, right? Height represents probability here, just like height did in our sort of 1D example. Only now we've got two random variables. And and these are all showing the same thing, right? We've got this, if we did an overhead view, we put a little bird on top, look, looking down, you can make this sort of contour map if, you, if you're happy with the contour maps where the lines are supposed to be the more sort of concentric collections of lines mean more and more <laughs> steep sort of climbing up. So this is supposed to be quite up high. Or you can think of it as a heat map, right? So <coughs> the hotter it is, the more probable it is. I haven't labeled the axes here, right? Uh, it doesn't I mean, maybe we could we could say this is zero or this is uh, you know 500 kilograms. Not many people who are uh, one centimeter tall and 500 kilograms, and and maybe quite a few people that are sort of in this um, I don't know what that's 150 <coughs> centimeters uh, and I don't know kilograms very well. I'm sorry. Okay, so hopefully you won't get confused if if we show you graphs like this, like this, or we ask you to to plot graphs like this. If, if you don't like the continuous domain, and I'm not very comfortable with it sometimes, you can imagine that um, you can just keep zooming into this image and look at a given pixel and say, okay, how hot is that pixel? That's my probability. And, and so we can generate these or we can read these and, and they're meaningful to us. This is our continuous variable. This is our discrete variable. Maybe we ask, um, I don't know, we asked how many siblings you have versus uh, how many children you have, and we see if there's a correlation uh, there. Um, we could come up with all kinds of examples of discrete variables. If you, if you have continuous variables, you can always quantize them uh, and represent them this way. Here, these last two, we have a funny situation. We're saying, actually, this variable is going to be continuous. This one's going to be discrete. Right. So uh, while people's maybe what are we doing height varies according to this uh, to this axis, we use another random variable, a discrete random variable, to measure um, how many years of um, how many years of on the job experience they have quantized into some sort of bids, like one year bids. And now here you see that if we talk about height, right, which shouldn't be correlated with experience in any way, but if we look at height, it's, it's a different plot depending on which y we're talking about, y equals 1, 2, 3, or 4. And similarly, we can flip it on its head and have x be discrete and y be continuous. Right, so we have continuous, we have discrete, random variables. We can plot the joint probability, and the joint probability is always this type of representation where you say, no, I, have to, I can't just look at one. Someone asked me, what is the probability of uh, tomorrow being uh, rain? And I go, oh, which one, which column is rain? This one's rain, isn't it? Okay, I have to look at all of this information. And my answer is, what did you want to know? How was the probability of being rain? Ooh, well, that depends. Is it a Monday, a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday? So the joint probability contains that information, but it, it is preparing us and saying the answer is 
is not so simple. You can't just ask for one dimension and ignore the other. Marginalization does let you do that. So marginalization says, you know, we've got one of these plots now, right? So we're happy with this, this probability plot that says, I've got two variables, two random variables, x and y, and uh, there's a heat map showing that that's probably the most probable uh, combination that we've seen historically, right? Or this is sort of another peak. So, um, all right, it's good. We've got this data captured. And now somebody comes along and says, what's the probability of x? So we are looking at a given x. Um, let's say we're, let's say this red line doesn't exist yet. We're looking at a given x. And someone says, all right, what's the probability at x equals 7? So we say, uh, okay, I want to fill in this height. What is the probability that x equals 7? And you think, well, there's some non-zero probability that x equals 7 when y equals 1. And when there's a, not a different number when y equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we've got to combine all of the information we have about all the different versions of x equals 7. And that combination is just a summation. So we're, we're integrating. We're saying walk along the y-axis, d little delta y's, step, 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 step. Combine them all together, evaluating this graph, probability of x and y jointly, and that will be our probability of x. If you do that for that x, that x, that x, that x, you eventually come up with this graph, which is the probability of random variable x being equal to all of these possible values, and there's no y in this equation. We've marginalized out y. y doesn't matter to us. No surprise, you can do the same thing for the probability of y, marginalizing out the x. So then you get this kind of graph. If I just handed you this graph, or just this one, you would, you would be missing part of the picture. You would say, uh, yeah, that's probably the peak. That's good. But you would be unaware that there is this sort of uh, island here and that if the y value was low or high. Yeah. Low, and it's lower than the middle. And if the y value was low, actually there's another peak hiding here. So marginalization is useful to us, uh, but it of course doesn't contain as much information as the joint probability. All right, marginalization works in the discrete case too. You replace the integral by a summation sign, right? I, like I said, I like the discrete world more, so for me it's easier to think of everything being a summation with very, very small increments. Um, so it's the same exact concept. All right. Obviously, if you have mixed, continuous, and discrete, you can do this sort of thing. You can marginalize over the discrete domain or marginalize over the continuous domain. You just have to use either integration or summation Whichever, whichever happens to be um, the dimension. So hopefully this type of notation is okay. We're going to be using probability. This, this is supposed to be read as probability of x. This is read as probability of x and y. So this is our joint probability. We've got sums and integrals. And that's pretty much as complex as the math gets today. The only thing is we're going to uh, add a few more variables potentially. So uh, if we have higher numbers of dimensions, let's say instead of just x and y, now we have w, x, y, and z. So I've, I've measured lots of data. I've, I've observed, um, you know, I've gone and, and, and stalked you on Facebook, and I've collected um, all kinds of biometric information about you. I've got tons of variables, w, x, y, and z. And now I'm just trying to make this 2D probability distribution graph on x and y. I'm, I'm going to marginalize out all the other information. So just like we were doing, we're going to integrate that out. Uh, so here we're going to integrate out z and w. But w happens to be uh, discrete, so we have to do a summation. If we, and z happens to be continuous, so that's an integral. So now it looks hairy, but we're just taking a sum of an integral. Okay, so. If, you, if this is somehow difficult, just picture, remember, that, that graph and reading off the pixel values, right? Hot colors mean big numbers, and so we add up big numbers. Cold means 
flat there means means low numbers, so we'll be adding up low numbers. So, so far, we haven't introduced any kind of equations for the probability of this. There's no parametric model so far. It's just adding up those intensity values of the, of the probabilities. Okay. We have joint probability. We have marginalization. Now there's conditional probability. We're, we're interested in knowing the probability of x under, but we're not going to ignore y, but we're not going to be looking at all of y. We're not interested in all the versions of y. We're just going to look at the conditional probability of x given that y equals y1. So we've got our old faithful 2D plot of the probability distribution over two random variables, x and y. It's hot, it's cold, and someone has calculated it for us everywhere. This is great. A lot of times we don't have that. A lot of times we just have little sprinklings of data that tell us, you know, well, who we observed walking into this room, and from that we might have to generalize, kind of like an like an exit poll for a, for a, an election. All right. But in this case, someone has gone to the trouble of labeling every single pixel with hot versus cold. That's that's great. I'm grateful, but I'm going to ask for some simplification of that data. I want to know the conditional probability that of x given that y equals y1. y1 is this this line right here. Uh, and so I'm interested in knowing what is what does my random variable x look like on that on that graph. I could choose a different y, I could use y2, and then the plot would be different, giving us sort of this and this respectively. So conditional probability is adding this condition, this bar, right? On the keyboard you could use the pipe symbol. This is saying probability of x given some condition. And then on the right side here, we're specifying the condition. All right. If we say, OK, uh, maybe not y1, maybe not y2, just in general. I, I want to have a nice general equation. I want to say, what is the probability, the conditional probability, so the probability that x, probability of x given that y equals some y star. And I'm not specifying y1 versus y2. I'm just saying, in general, that it equals some specific y star. So that is the joint probability. Notice no bar here. It's the probability of x comma y equals y star divided by something. Now this, this something is the same as the numerator, only it's integrating out the, the dx. We're marginalizing out x here in the denominator. So we're, we're saying, all right, uh, we have some probability, the joint probability of x and y equals y star. So that means actually reading off the numbers from this plot and looking at a given y. But we have to divide it through by this term, which is in marginalizing out the x and saying, OK, but we're going to ignore the x. The reason for this is we're, we're trying to normalize. If I go back to my old plots here, well, this one's fine, and I, and I say, well, we're talking about probabilities. So the probability of this value of x, this value of y. If I integrated out all of it, if I combined all of this, summed up all of this, what would this all add up to? One. 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 Because we're saying everything in the world, in my world here, fits on this graph. It, there is some non-zero probability of this, some non-zero probability of this. In total, the situations that can happen are all represented here. So add all this up, it adds up to one. If we come forward now, here, and we look at just one of these slices and look at sort of the contour that's generated from that, it can't add up to one, those, those probabilities, right? Because this is only a very small subset of the pixels in this, in this 2D graph. But if I'm going to write a conditional probability, the result of that has to still be a sum to one. It may be that y equals y1 is very small, um, but it's still saying that all of the possibilities for, for y happening are represented. So our graph, then, when we do this normalization, before and after uh, the normalization, will have the same shape, 
it's just going to have different y-axis because now we have a real probability and this is representing probability the, the conditional probability of x given y equals y1. So we can write this denominator term where we're marginalizing. We already know how to write that. That's marginalizing out x. So that's just the probability that y equals y star. And we'll frequently shorthand that and just write probability of y. So we have conditional probability. Um, we know that uh, we can write this as probability of y. Same way this y equals y star can be just probability of x comma y. So that goes in the numerator here. And similarly, this y equals y star just gets simplified to y. So now we have this equation saying, all right, the conditional probability of x given y equals the probability of x and y divided by the probability of y. And now, simple algebra allows us <coughs> to manipulate things and move the probability, the, the joint probability over here and the probability of x given y over here. So we have probability of x given y times probability of y equals the joint probability of x and y. Similarly, there's no reason we can't do it the other way around, that we can't examine the probability of y and, so the joint probability, probability of y, and that x equals some x star. So that would lead us to this other equation. Probability of y given x times probability of x is equal to the joint probability, probability x and y. Alright, so we have two equations at the bottom, both of them equal the joint probability, probability of x and y. So um, we're going to use that to devise Bayes' rule in just a moment, but the final thing to mention is that, again, we can have more than just two variables. Uh, we can talk about the joint probability of w and x and y and z. That breaks down. We can separate it off into its components. Uh, there are many combinations of these components, but as an example, we could say, right, this joint probability equals, and I'm reading this out in a very sort of loud and obnoxious way, I want to make sure that we're all sort of reading these equations like they're English, so, they, so they're not baffling to us, so not, not difficult. So this is probability of w and x and y given z times the probability of z. Notice what we've done here, right? This equals that. We're saying you want to make a conditional probability of what is probability of these joint variables given some z. That's okay, but you have to take into account the giving of that z. You have to take into account what kind of z's can you be handed. And this term, this last term, is taking care of that. It's saying, well, some z's are more likely than others. Remember z, just like a random variable, maybe high z's are more likely than low z's. This is, this graph, or this, this probability distribution, is keeping track of that for us. So when you multiply that by that, you come back to the, the joint probability. You could decompose this first term further. You could move the y over to the conditional side. But notice what happens. When you move the y over here, you're now saying, I want to know the probability of w and x given y, and the probability of w and x given z. We have to look at both of these conditions. And these conditions can't be looked at completely independently. So, what we have to do is actually make this term more complicated. We now make it probability of y given z times probability of z. Because if we multiply this together, you end up with probability of, anyone want to venture? Y z. Y, z. y and z. So if we do that times the probability of w and x conditioned on y z, then we're, then we're OK. And similarly, we can keep separating off and, and, and breaking it into components. And we could have done this in some other way so that this last term wasn't probability of z. We could have done that as, as y and, and move things around, and that would be fine. The thing that this is preserving is it's saying, look, we have to look at the joint probability. We have to look at the fact that w and x and y and z, they could all be correlated to each other. There's a chance. We just don't know yet. Right? So don't, don't assume that they're independent. 
until we maybe expressly say they're independent. For now, we don't know that they're independent, so we have to keep all of these dependencies alive, right? If z being high or low has some impact, it will be felt all the way back on w. All right, so now we come to Bayes' rule. Remember those two equations we said? Conveniently, joint probability of x and y equals two different things. We can set them equal to each other, and here we go. Probability of y given x times probability of x equals the conditional probability of x given y times probability of y. I can use conditional in, in the naming. I'm, I'm not trying to make it any more confusing. Maybe it's easier just look at the equation, probability of x given y. It says, if you fix the y, I can tell you about x. And this is saying, but, but let me tell you about y, because it has a backstory. Now we can re rearrange this, right? We could leave the y given x over here and move probability of x into the denominator. And this is probably the most common representation of Bayes' rule, this, this equation right here. You could expand the denominator because we know that probability of x, wait a minute, wasn't there a y involved? Ah, uh, yes, we know that marginalization helps us go from probability of x and y to probability of x. So probability of x we know comes from looking at this joint probability and integrating out the, the dy, summing up all those versions of, of dy. And similarly, we know that this joint probability of x and y inside of the integral, well, that also can be expanded into probability of x given y times probability of y. So you should just see that equals that. So people say Bayes' rule. Typically, they're thinking of this one, but it's all the same equation. Remember we started here, this, this equation, this combining equation? I find it helpful to remember this as Bayes' rule. This is just me, because then you realize, well, there's no reason we have to talk about probability of y given x. We could equally talk about probability of x given y equals this term divided by probability of y moved over to the other side. Still Bayes' rule. Okay. Bayes' rule terminology, same equation, rewritten. We've just taken that last, last version at the bottom. Upper left term here is the likelihood. We're saying the probability of x given y. It's the propensity of observing a certain x given that someone has pre-decided for you what is y going to be. Probability of y on the right is prior. These are nice English names that we give, shorthand, so we don't always have to rattle off probability of x given y. Okay, so this is the prior probability of y. It just says you're you're conditioning on y. That's great, but there's a prior story on on y. Yes. What's the difference between propensity and probability? And the propensity is is kind of a I would put that maybe in quotes. This is sort of a pretending that the variable is is a human and it likes certain numbers more than others. Probability is properly probability between zero and one. You look at all the possibilities; they add up to one. Um, this is uh, maybe me being a bit uh, shorthanded with the English. But it, it, is that okay? Yeah. All right. And we have the denominator, which is the evidence. So here we're saying we want to make sure that it's a valid distribution, that when we look at the numerator actually across y given x, uh, it still adds up all to, to 1. All, all outcomes are being long. So likelihood, prior, evidence. All right. Uh, ah, most important, the posterior on the left. The posterior, uh, if you think of it as uh, post, the post part of it, this is saying I've done everything and, I, and I'm looking at the outcome after I've observed all that there was to observe. I had some kind of prior preconceived notion about y. Someone told me what to expect about the random variable y. And then they came along and gave me some data. They gave me some x. And I take into account the likelihood of x. And I normalize by the evidence. And at the end, I, can, I have a new interpretation of my variable y. I can say posterior distribution of random variable y 
given this new data x is this new thing that I've computed. So this is the, the posterior. I think prior as in before, posterior as in after, and I think everything will be fine. Alright. Now we said we're assuming nothing about the variables. Maybe they're correlated, maybe they're not. Um, one way of, uh, of looking at this is if you can make money by betting on one variable uh, using information from the other, then the variables are actually correlated and uh, they are not independent. But sometimes you get lucky, sometimes they are independent. So here we've got a very similar distribution, same kind of plot as before, random variable x versus random variable y. We look at the conditional probability of x given y. We say, all right, um, I'm going to tell you what this x curve looks like. I'm going to pick y equals 1, and maybe it looks like this. I'm going to pick y equals 2, and it looks like this. Notice the height is the same, right? Just re-emphasizing here. This was quite hot at its peak. This was not as hot. This was sort of a, a bright yellow. This was kind of a red. But we normalized, right? So when we normalize, these, these end up having the same height, the same shape. And, and look, they are in fact the same shape. As we sweep from left to right, they're the same shape. So this is telling me that if I'm trying to, um, if I'm trying to bet, I'm trying to make a prediction about uh, the probability of different values of x, then it doesn't help me to know the value of y. There's no added information. Whereas if, uh, if we had some of those previous plots, right, and someone, well, that's uh, a pretty messy one. In the previous plot, if someone said, actually, your y is, is up here somewhere, I would have said, really? If it's up here, then my x values are probably somewhere in this range. So there, there's a very strong correlation between x and y. But when there's not such a correlation, coming forward again, when there's not such a correlation, you can make this simplifying assumption that the conditional probability, the probability of x conditioned on y, just equals probability of x. It made no difference. In other words, integrating out the y produce the same as we had when we started. So independence between variables is a special condition. We will uh, be taking advantage of it sometimes, but not all the time. Independence exists also in the discrete case. Uh, not much point in belaboring it, right? I can choose a y1 or I can choose a y2. When you normalize the size of these squares, you end up with these kinds of plots. And you would say, well, wait a minute, they're actually uh, identical in proportion, they, they, they come out being the same size. So here again, x and y are independent of each other. All right. Expectation. If we have uh, our probability distribution, we're saying based on prior history, based on data we've seen before, I think I can predict how the dice are going to be rolled. I think I can predict what the weather is going to be. I can't tell you with certainty what it's going to be tomorrow, but overall I expect this sort of proportion of weather, and that's my, my discrete or my continuous graph. Now, if you have some, that's just a probability, right? If you have some function of that, right? If we say, well, hold on, uh, my function in this case might be rainfall, right? I have a function of the weather. This function, uh, knows it takes as an input what the weather is and it spits out something like rainfall. Then I want to know what is the expected value of the rainfall for different weather that I might observe with my random variable x. So expectation tells us the expected or average value of some function. So we take into account x, we say, well, I I'm not committing that tomorrow is going to be a very specific kind of weather. But overall, given the distribution of weather that can happen tomorrow, I can still tell you what the expected rainfall will be. And I do that by looking at the probability of the different states we talked about. We talked about weather, so this is just probability of x. And I multiply it by this function of x. So basically, we're doing a weighted sum here. Yes. So you're saying x is like cloud, like how the percentage of the sky that's covered by clouds, and then f is uh, the probability, or f is how much 
is relating the cloud color to the rainbow. I want it, that's, that's, that's almost exactly perfect. I want to just take away the word probability from f of x. Okay. f of x is some deterministic function. Okay, I've come up with some formula. Okay, uh, maybe it's smart, maybe it's a dumb formula, but it, is, it takes as an input x. There's no uncertainty about it, it just takes x x equals something, you plug it in, it spits out rain. But otherwise, it's exactly right. So the probability is all wrapped up here in probability of x. f of x is just computing this, this uh, deterministic function that's spitting out a number. So if we look back at those 2D plots, or uh, well, in this case, we've only got one variable. So we only look at a single plot, right? A single graph. We would say, OK, go to x equals 0 and compute f of Zero. How much rainfall are you in the? Is there when the weather is? Uh, I don't know. We, we discretize our weather patterns into, into six different types of weather, and we compute that number and we add it up to the num similar numbers we get when we try out all the different x's. That's going to be our expected value of f of x. So it's kind of like marginalization, right? Except that it's not a probability for f of x. This is just this deterministic thing. Um, and similarly, it could be it's a sum or an integral depending on whether uh, whether x is continuous or discrete. So the expected value of f of x um, can also be done as a two-dimensional in a two-dimensional probability space. The only thing is that f might be well, looking at which type of weather we're in and what the temperature was, right? So maybe this f function, this deterministic f function, is a little bit smarter. It takes two variables, and conveniently, we've, we've plotted those variables. We've said, what is the probability of x jointly with y? The, the simplest version that you've used, and I promise you've used this, is where you assume equal probability everywhere, where you just say, oh, I'm going to average together the weather over the whatever last week. And I'm going to say, what's the expected? What was the expected value? Um, but averaging is just assuming a constant probability everywhere, right? Averaging just says, okay, I'm going to weight f of x y, or let me go back to back one. It's just saying, I'm going to look at f of x, and for for one condition of x, I'm going to look at f of x for every other condition. I'm going to just average them all together, weighting them equally. And here we're saying, you know, it's not equal. These probabilities are all numbers smaller than one, right? But when you add up all the probabilities, it adds up to one. So overall, this is this, this better version of a weighted weighting of the function f of x. All right. So we did two variables. And now uh, some, some famous names for expectations, right? So you can have all kinds of expectations, uh, but some of them have special names. So if you have a variable, random variable x, the expectation of x uh, could be the mean, where you just say, I want to know the mean mu x, so we're using mu here for that. You can have x to the k, so that's the kth moment about zero. Um, I won't go through all of them, but this one's quite important, where you take x minus the mean to the kth power, normally to the second power, that's the one used quite a lot for, for many um, modeling purposes, where we're measuring the variance. We're saying, how much does this value deviate from its own mean? Right? It's kind of a normal temperature or normal rainfall. And then, um, sorry, let me stick to temperature. There's sort of a, a normal temperature. That's our mean when we average everything together. And we're looking at how much deviation is there, and we're squaring that, and that's called variance. Skew, kurtosis, um, these all get into higher dimensional, uh, just higher order functions of how far away are we from our mean. Um, there are these uh, great debates about what are the names for um, when you go up higher, fifth and sixth. Uh, so there's, um, I think the next one, no, I don't want to. I don't want to venture it. It's it's a it's a heated debate, and I and I don't want to get into it. All right. So, uh, the other thing to note is if if instead of x we have x and y, then again we're going to look at the difference between our x and the mean x and the y and its mean y. 
So that's going to be the covariance of x and y, and we're going to take advantage of that um, pretty soon. Not today. So some of the expectation functions have special names. We'll be using uh, variance, covariance, and mean throughout the term quite heavily. Okay. A few rules about expectations. Um, one of them is if you have a constant, then the expectation of the constant is just the constant. In other words, there's no dependency here on anything else. So of course, we're just going to get back the same constant. Not very controversial, right? right? If you have an expectation of some constant time to function of x, then you could just multiply that constant by the expectation of f of x, and you get the same answer. So the constant can be can travel outside of the expectation and be computed here, right? Expectation doesn't care what the constant is doing. Further. If you have two functions, you're trying to find out the expectations of f of x plus g of x, then you could just compute the expectation separately for f of x and the expectation of g of x, figure out what they are separately, and add them together. Okay? And finally, if you have a product, so you have expectation of f of x times g of y, then you can only multiply them, e of f of x times e of g of y, only if x and y are independent. Otherwise, you're throwing away, because you're throwing away here the, independent, the, the dependencies between them. So this equation will not be true if x and y are dependent on each other. Like we said, uh, somebody's height and their weight correlated, right? So if those are your two variables, then you cannot, cannot do this. If someone asks you for the expectation of f of x times g of y, you're not allowed to make this simplification then. Right. So these are just these rules that we will have to abide by. Uh, otherwise, there's not much, not much really happening here. OK, so we'll, we'll wrap up, and then I'll make an announcement. Uh, we've given the rules of probability. We're going to keep using these all, all term pretty compact and reasonably simple, at least in their original form. We're not going to try to make things more complicated. <coughs> the only thing that will get more complicated is we're going to start using x to mean something about our images and y to mean something about our data. Concepts of marginalization, right? marginalizing out, joint probabilities, conditional probabilities. Um, we're going to use these to write equations, write our models for everything we do. So please get used to them. If you haven't seen the words prior, posterior, before, absolutely fine. It's totally expected you're, you're in the majority. But we're going to use them so much that they should become pretty pretty commonplace and, and understandable. Uh, and we'll come back to conditional expectations uh, at a later date. All right, now, about the announcement. Uh, we have... We have, does anyone not have slides right now? Uh, a handout with the slides. One person. All right. So we've actually gone up slightly. Can I, this is not in any way trying to single you out, um, but it, maybe with nodding heads so I can kind of see, not, not, not subtly, people who are not officially registered for the class. Just nod for me like this. Or you can raise hands as well. Okay. Um, Alright, so uh, I am. I welcome you. I want to get a nice big room, and, and everything should be fun. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to have people taking the class or visiting the class. The only the only downside is that people not registered for the class don't appear on their records. So when I say, "Give me a bigger room," I only I only have space for you know uh, three quarters of the room to sit down. And the rest are groaning, right? They're groaning right there. Yes, that's good. Uh, then, then they say, well, you know, but you don't have that many people registered. Uh, so, if you're deciding whether to register or not, great. But you know, the sooner you register, the, the, the stronger.